All right, Tribe, this is episode 14 of our 18-part series on Become Your Own Banker. We recorded these several years ago, but wanted to do a refresh because there's so many questions around this amazing concept of infinite banking. And in this episode, you're going to learn things like when Nelson breaks down the actual costs of acquisition, he's not just talking about just money. He's talking about time. He's talking about speed. He's talking about control. These are things you're going to want to tune into in today's episode as we break this down. And don't forget uh, the higher rate of return. This is one of the most common questions as a result in uh, becoming your own banker, infinite banking. Isn't there a better place for me to invest? Is this really what become your own banker is all about is just getting this uh, investment return from the insurance company? I think you're going to want to hear all the things we break down in this episode, uh, episode 14 of Becoming Your Own Banker book review. Welcome to the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast, your guide to understanding how to get out of the Wall Street rat race and start your own mailbox money lifestyle. Now, don't let these handsome Southern draws fool you. These financial minds are teaching our country to enhance savings, increase cash flow, and create passive income, all without the help of Wall Street. Are you ready to break through? Now here are your hosts, Russ Morgan and Joey Murray. Welcome. This is the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Your host, Joey the Italian Stallion Murray, joined as always by Russ the Idea Guy Morgan. So Russ, we are diving back into Nelson Nash's famous book, Becoming Your Own Banker. And can you imagine this is only an 88 page book and we are on part 14. <laughs> I mean, are we either the slowest people in the world at breaking this down or it's just that deep? Well, both. I think both is the answer there. <laughs> both and. And if this is the first time you're listening to our podcast, welcome. Glad to have you. And obviously you're going to probably want to go back at some point and listen to more of this, you know, the first 13 parts of this book to better understand what we're talking about. But I think even just listening to today's subject matter, you're going to relate because when the part that we're focusing on in Nelson Nash's book today is two different parts. One is the cost of acquisition. Anytime we have to borrow money, there is a lot of unseen cost strings, if you will, that come along with it. And I think you and I have both lots of personal stories there no we doubt. can talk about. The second part that we're going to be covering in today's is, but I can get a higher rate of return because we're talking about using cash value, dividend paying, whole life insurance in order to, uh, to perform the control function, the cash, the banking uh, function, right? The alternative to cash. And a lot of times that subject matter is, but I can do real estate investing or I can start an online business or I could do a lending um, operation. I can make a lot more money and we're going to cover like, yes, you can. And this is just the add on. This the is the, this is the plus to that addition. That's right. So I, I want to start real quickly as we were kind of leading off with the cost of acquisition. When, when I was younger and much more prideful and someone who uh, didn't have all the quite a, the knowledge I have today. Wait, how, how, how long ago was this just for clarity? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, it depends. It could have been like a second ago. That's true. Right. Well, but let me, I'm going to take you back to when Megan and I were getting married. Mm. And this was before I knew her parents very well. So what I'm going to say, a little bit of a disclaimer here. I didn't know them and they were not actually, if I would have known them better, I would have known what I'm about to say was really dumb. <laughs> but I think it, it, it holds water into the discussion. So I was talking to her one night and I said, hey, look, I want to pay for our wedding. Wow. Yeah, I, and now pretty, I didn't. I didn't want to do that out of like just good nature. Like, I, man, I, 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 I don't want you. Guy. I don't want your parents to not have to pay for it. I said that to her, Joey, because I wanted to control the the process. I wanted to be able to do whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted, because I wanted. Mm. And and I I thought this is going to be a big event, and if someone else is paying for it, they might be able to tell me what they wanted done, and I wouldn't even be able to choose they're if going, I wanted that. They're going to have strings attached to whatever it is that they're giving. This is a gift, but eh, but well, yeah. let's also do this. Well, here's the thing. By the way, FYI, that never happened. They, I never paid, nor did they ever <laughs> ask us to do anything because they paid. It was a wonderful wedding. But that is the way I think of whenever someone else is paying for something, there are stipulations. Right. And I can't imagine what you dealt with in the mortgage industry. 
Oh man. I, let, let me just say, I can pull out of the treasure trove of potential stories here, but one in particular I can remember. I remember on many occasions asking people for the most ludicrous of documents, right? Stuff that makes no sense whatsoever, but it was just, I have to check this box in order to get you approved for this mortgage. And in one particular instinct, I, I, instance, I remember talking to, this is a CEO of one of the health systems around Birmingham. Um, th- this guy makes tons of money. He's trying to buy a house. Let's say it was, I don't, I don't remember the, all the particulars. Let's say it was a million dollars and, and I'm calling up Keith. Hey, Keith, um, by the way, I know you're buying this million dollar house. You're putting down $200,000 and you have an account that has half a million dollars in it that you've already shown me. We've already verified everything for your down payment. But you know, there was this deposit made into your bank account, um, you know, two, two or three weeks ago for $297. Um, and we, we failed to let the underwriter know what that $297 was, like where it came from. So I'm going to need you to write a letter of explanation, sign it, date it, and then provide to me a copy of the canceled check from your bank account so that we can prove that it wasn't from some like, you know, uh, un, un, uh, allowable place. Joey, I can right now imagine Keith wanting to punch you through the phone. Oh, I'm glad it was through the phone. If it was in person, that's exactly what he would have done. But the, the point I'm trying to make here, one, it was ridiculous to have to ask him that. But number two, what was the cost to him of one, having to take that phone call, two, having to go now scrounge, this is two or three days before closing. So it's not like, well, he, hey, we got time to deal he with He doesn't this. hand that off to his assistant because it's personal bank stuff. Right. So he has to stop what he's doing. We're talking hundreds to thousands of dollars per hour and go and find a way to get me these ridiculous documents so that he can buy the house so that he's not sitting there homeless. Here's the issue that I think we've all experienced because we've all had something similar to that along the way. We're like, this is ridiculous. Why am I having to do it? But those who have the gold make the rules. Yep. And there's this cost of acquisition that goes over and beyond the interest that we pay on the debt. And I think Nelson Nash is really wanting to drive home that point here because he's saying, look, infinite banking, when we have designed a whole life contract the way we design them, right. we're putting as much cash as the government will allow us to put in them without them being a taxable um, a, account. When we design them, we put all of this cash in there. We don't have to have those sort of mental hoops and obstacles to go through. We literally get to make a phone call or an email and get money on deposit. That's right. And I think what he was trying to say here in Nelson's uh, book, he's talking about Leia Coca here. He's talking about several examples where there was this cost that was unseen. And I think that's the point we need to pull out here. The scene that everybody kind of focuses in on, and you and I have grown up being programmed to think interest rate, right? Like that's the only cost of this finance. But what's the unseen I think is what Nelson's talking about is the cost of acquisition. In the first one, there's three buckets I feel like that this falls into. One is time, which I just kind of mentioned with that CEO of the the health system. He had to, it cost him time, which eventually created money loss. Two is speed and three is control. Now, when we're talking about speed, what do you think, what do you think we're talking about there? Well, I'm thinking of when there's an opportunity to take advantage of like the ability to access money, the speed in which you can do it really can can be the difference between getting a deal or losing a deal. Absolutely. Now you can't quantify that necessarily because some, it's not like it shows up somewhere and says, Oh, well I missed out on these three deals that could have been millions of dollars because I didn't have access to quick funds. I mean, do you remember the story Nelson told about that guy that needed money like that day. I, I'm, I'm forgetting the details. No, he, he had a guy that basically he um, had sold some land. Uh, they bought some land from and the guy had sold it to him on terms. That's right. And Nelson was paying him off, you know, monthly owner finance. And a guy calls Nelson up one day and says, hey, look, if, you know, the deal I gave you was a sweetheart deal from the beginning. Uh, I've kind of underestimated my need for money <laughs> is what Nelson would always say. And he said, look, if, if you could pay me off the, the rest of the term of the, of the note today, I'll discount it another like 50%. 
And he goes, this is basically meaning I was buying the property at like 20 cents on the dollar. It's like, it was a no brainer. I mean, you and I are, are, are flipping land now. We're trying right. to buy a property at 25 to 30 cents on a dollar. We pay cash all the time. And he was getting that deal. And Nelson said, just stay where you are really quickly <laughs> and I'll be back. And he went down he, in Birmingham. Actually, the, uh, he, he had a, a life insurance policy with a company that was local. Um, and he was able to go down to the home office and get them to write a check. And he was taking it back to that guy. So that way he could, he could get the deal before he changed his mind. Before, I remember he said that. Yeah, he said before he changed his mind, because he knew the, the speed at which he could put a check in his hand meant that guy was going to do it. That's right. How many of you are real estate investors right now listening and you know exactly what it feels like to have that deal go right out from under your nose because you didn't have access to cash today and that's what would have made all the difference. So that's the cost of acquisition. I think Nelson's pointing out here. The third is control. And I, I want to relate this to what we talked about even on the last book review was the vehicle in which you're building wealth matters. Okay. Yeah. We're talking about uh, the last episode where Nelson said the biggest dangerous place you could put money is in a government sponsored plan, right? IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, you know, all the acronyms you can possibly think of, 529s. These are dangerous places, but not only dangerous, I think if you know what the parameters are that are around these types of vehicles, they are limiting. And so that's a cost that I think we should point out. If you've listened to our show for any length of time, you've heard us talk about infinite banking and how we were able to use that concept to create over $50,000 a month in passive income. But it's just not that easy to figure out how does this all connect into my own personal system? Stallion, that's why we created the Passive Income Operating System, bro. It shows you how to turn active income into passive income it makes all the steps come together if you would like to get access to it as a podcast listener we've never given this away in public before go to what's what wall street.com forward slash p-i-o-s there was nothing worse than walking into class when you're in school and the teacher saying pop quiz day why because you were unprepared are you unprepared though for financial freedom don't be. Find out how close you are by taking our 30 second quiz at wealthwithoutwallstreet.com forward slash quiz. No, it's a, it's a big cost, right? Because if you can't access the money, you don't get to make the decisions. A lot of times we get emails from you uh, or messages in the inner circle that says, hey, you know, I'm looking at buying fill in the blank. It could be a car. It could be a boat. It could be a house, a brutal house, a piece of land. Should I, A, take a loan against the insurance policy, or B, go get a bank loan for it. That's right. And the beauty of that question from our clients who have cash values that they could do is that they have the ability to want to choose which one. They Those get, options. Th that's the control. That's right. When we have put our money in accounts that we can't access, we don't get the one. Because I think back to, we talk about, you know, stopping trading time for money. That's right. Right. But if, you want to keep doing your job because you love it, regardless if you own the company or just an employee of the company. That's a beautiful thing that you get to go to work every, every day because you want to, but we never want to have to. And that's the way I think about this control aspect is that the, in most people's situations, their money doesn't reside in an account that they can access. So it's never, should I take a policy loan because they don't have it? And it doesn't matter. They can't go, well, should I, should I go access the money out of my 401k? They know they can't touch it. Right. It's okay. It's there. So I have to go get a bank loan. And now I've got to subject myself to Joey's of the world who are asking me stupid $297 questions <laughs> on my half a million dollar account. Like, what? Yeah. Why are you doing that? Yeah, the, the choice is that you don't have to. And that, I love that. Now, one other thing I want to point out about that, that you actually mentioned this to me the other day, Russ, is the, the rules around even like some people say, well, I have a self-directed IRA. So that puts me in better control, right? I, I now know what I'm investing in. But it's not really true. Yeah, man, the, the self-directed IRA concept it is, is one of those where, yes, if I have put money in jail, and I'm tired of investing in, in terrible things like mutual funds. Volatility. I know, where I know that I'm not going to be the one making the majority of the money. That money's going to flow up to mutual fund managers and then to uh, stock portfolio guys. I mean, it, before 
uh, the the in return gets to me, it's I mean, it's squeezed out. It, it's done, right? Well, but if you want to invest in things like real estate, right? People say, oh, well, I love my SEP IRA because I invest in real estate. Yes, you can as long as it's syndicated or you're not, it's turnkey and you're not touching it because you can't invest in real estate in a fix and flip that you're a part of. They, you can't do that. There's rules governing that for, for the self IRA rule. Well, I also know that you, we don't want to grow our accounts and those kind of things too, because at the end of the day, the more money we grow in them, the more tax burden we're creating. Yeah. And we're sharing our own growth with the, uh, with the U S government. Yeah. It's, Why would we do that? It, and that goes back to what we're saying that there's two sides of this and, and Frederick, uh, Frederick Bastiat and Henry Hazlitt, they, they address these uh, two phenomenons in, in their books where they talked about the seen and unseen. There's this consequence that sometimes we only focus on this very uh, initial stage of things, the seen, but we forget the unseen, the, the part that comes along the corner. Like you were saying, the, the, nobody goes and sees how many hours did it take that CEO of that healthcare institution to go get that information for you. It was it one, two, three. Well, that had cost. It had a direct cost to him or had direct cost to his employer, right? Because there was three hours of work he probably did on company time to get that stuff done or two hours or one hour, whatever it was. They were paying him for that. And so the, the value that he brought to the business was less because of that. And, and that just, we see that across uh, society is that there's constant unseen implications to things that go on. And Nelson addressed several in this book. I'd love for you to go back, read page 68. You'll see what I'm talking about. You'll see how he addressed Lee Iacocca. Let's go to the second part of today's discussion, which is, but I can get a higher rate of return. Oh, if I have heard that one time, I've heard that a million times. And to be honest with you, I'm not surprised because that's what we've been programmed again. As we just said, the seen part of this is what rate of return am I going to get for parking my money here? And it's something we've been, again, focused in on the wrong side of the equation. What do we learn here is that the actual use of the policy is not, it, the policy itself is not the end. And it's we've not. talked about this over and over again. It, it really is not. And I, and I know this when you may be hearing this for the first time or just learning about infinite banking, it's easy to get hung up in asking the technical questions like, what is the return on the insurance policy? How much does the insurance company charge when you borrow the money? We want to break it down into the terms that we're familiar with because that's the way the financial world has, has uh, conditioned us, right? right? Like you as a mortgage guy, what was one of the major questions people always ask you? Everybody, <laughs> what's the interest rate? What's the interest rate? We're so focused on the interest rate. But let me ask you, Joey, if you could give them a 1% interest rate on their mortgage with a five-year term, <laughs> or you could give them a 5% interest rate with a 30-year term, where do you think most people would want to land? Oh, they're always going to take the 30-year term. <laughs> Why? Because they can't afford the 1% loan. The terms, the right? Ter the five-year term is out of reach. It, it, it makes the payment out of reach. So really, rate is not the issue. We're talking about volume. We want to figure out how do we actually get to, to swallow this pill. And, and I think this is often missed in the infinite banking world, where when we say these insurance policies are nothing more than a window to the world. That's right. It's showing us things that we've never experienced and never thought possible because we have actually access to money and now we get to go tell it what to do. Uh, I love that. And, and compare that with what else are people thinking? They've been told by Dave Ramsey, oh, well, you can get 10 to 12% in mutual funds. Throw stock mutual funds. I mean, why would you put money in whole life? Index funds. Come Index. on. S&P, guaranteed it's always gone up at 8% historically. What about my Bitcoin or Ethereum? Right. These things are completely apples and oranges. Yeah, it is because really people don't realize that with the way these policies are designed, we're just setting it up as collateral. This is our safe capital, the, the storage house, or Nelson used to call it the warehouse for our wealth. Not where our wealth will be built, but where it will be stored. So that's, that's telling you something. Where you store wealth is not where it was created. Or where it ends. 
No. Right? It's not just because you store it there doesn't mean it's going to be there forever. So if you have a storage facility, is that where wealth is built? Is that where you, you come back and put stuff? That's where you come back and put it. So where are we going to put it? So there's the beauty of this, this question, and he addresses it so well in, in this book. He says, you know, when first exposed to the rationale and infant banking concept, a person will almost always think and often voice the thought, but I can get a higher rate of return by investing in fill in the blank. And as we just said, infinite banking is a and asset. It means I get the return from the insurance company. I get access to the money so that I can also and invest in fill in the blank. Now, I wouldn't choose any of the blanks we filled in a second ago, like mutual funds or Bitcoin or S&P 500 index funds, stuff like that. Not as a true place for wealth. But what we can do is we can use these cash value policies to go buy, and we do invest in rental properties, invest in short-term, long-term, land flipping, cattle, lending, name it. All those different things. That's why we have the inner circle, by the way. I'm, I'm going to do a shameless plug here. If you are not a member of our inner circle, you're missing out. This is where we're taking this whole idea, this process of infinite banking and applying it and saying, what are you doing with your policy? The policy is not the end. It's always calling us to the table, right? Like we always need accountability. We need a network of people who are helping us. And it's easy for us to fall trap into thinking that, well, well maybe the return is better. So I'm going to break down this one example. Is that okay, Joe? Yeah, let's do that. So, so Nelson says, let me demonstrate this this point here. Let's just assume that one person wants to invest $100,000 into an asset over a one-year period of time that will earn 20%. And he goes on to say, okay, so the gross yield on that investment would be $20,000, right? 20% of 100 grand. Now, he just said, let's assume it was taxable and they're in a 30% bracket. They have to pay six grand on their $20,000 that they earned. That's right. So the net uh, return is 14 grand. You with me? You keep score with that? Yep. All right, now he says, let's compare that to person B. And so let's assume they've built $100,000 in cash value in their insurance policies. And they want to use that dividend paying life insurance policy as collateral, borrow from the insurance company, get the 100K out, invest in the same thing. Now, if they both earn a 20% return, both of them now have a gross return of 20K. That's right. Me? Yep. But yet, if the insurance company, was charging an interest rate, and in this example, he's an 8% interest rate. Now, most of our companies we work with now are 5%, yeah. but he's just using 8% as the example. Just well, and clarify. one of the companies he was using, I think back, th- this book was written in early 2000s, was charging 8%. So he said, all right, so let's break down the numbers. They, they made a gross $20,000. They had to pay interest to the insurance company of 8K, so now they have a taxable gain of 12, because you can write off the interest you pay to the insurance company against the investment interest. Now, this is not Russ Morgan telling you this. This is my my CPAs telling me this. This is tax attorneys who are doing this for us every single uh, year. Now, so I got $12,000 taxable gain. I'm still going to have to pay tax on 30%. And so my net yield now is 8,400. So remember the first example, I made 20. I paid tax on six. I ended up with 14. In this example, I made 20, I paid 8K to the insurance company, then I had to pay 3,600 to the IRS on the the rest of that gain, so I netted 8,400. On the the outset, that doesn't sound like a good deal, Russ. That's that's where a lot of people miss it, right? That's right. But Nelson says, but there's more going on, right? What did your insurance policy do over that same time frame? While your money was out in this investment, excuse me, not your money, the insurance company's money, the loan you obtained from them is out at work. Your money is in the insurance policy doing what? Yeah, it is growing. Now, what Nelson showed here was the insurance company earning 8% on the money. I'm going to tell you right now, again, just like Joey said, we don't, uh, we don't pay 8% to insurance companies, nor do we earn 8% on them. But most insurance companies are going to charge you somewhere uh, around 5%, and most of their contracts right now are growing at roughly 5%. So for simplicity, if you think of this in today's numbers, I would have an interest rate cost of 5%. I'd probably have a gain of 5%. So Nelson takes his 8% gain that he earned internally into his policy. So now I take the 8,400 and I add the 8,000 on top of the 100, I got 16,400. Instead of 14,000 
from the, the previous one. Exactly. So what he's saying is that I get both. I get both the return of the investment plus I get the return from my storage house, the place that I stored my capital in. And the, the beauty of this is this is a simple example, but the bigger your policy or your policy systems become, the more your gross cash value becomes and you're gaining off of that larger balance, even if you're consistently doing, let's say that $100,000 investment. Well, there's a lot of parts in this uh, section. We'd love for you to go through and break down in pages 69 and 70. He even goes on to show you from a previous example we talked about equipment, equipment financing as the person kept borrowing money as they got through that cost of acquisition, right? Because an insurance policy, the highest cost is in usually the first one to 15 years. And that's where most of the fees and all that stuff has to get spread out. So he shows as that policy gets older, just kind of he gives an example of a plane burning off fuel and getting more efficient, these insurance policies become more efficient. The, the longer we have them. I've had a policy now, Joey, for over 10 years. I've showed it. I've even talked about it on the show before. I put in um, a dollar and last year, my dollar that I put in, I had a growth of twice of that. I had 14000 out on a $7,000 deposit. Now, it wasn't because of that one year, but it was because of the nine years prior. And if that's a storage house for our cash, every time I have a place to put it, I want to put it in there, right? Well, he's saying this is just the, the means to the end. So we want to help you through this podcast and through our inner circle find a way to get to financial freedom. I want you to know that it's going, your freedom is going to come when you have more cash flow, more passive income than you have monthly expenses. But it starts when we take control over our cash. And this is a great example to show that. That's right. This is called become your own banker for a reason. You have to take control of the banking function. And what Nelson is constantly showing us is one, reduce your cost of acquisition by being your own banker. And two, get your storehouse to be the most efficient place that it can possibly be. Replace the other places that you kept cash all the for your whole entire life that are inefficient and replace it with this new vehicle, this new means. And then, and this is the part that we've kind of been talking about a lot lately, this is where imagination comes in. When that cash is stored in the right warehouse and you're surrounded by the right people. Again, I cannot, I mean, it's a potentially shameless plug here, right? But our inner circle is the only place on the internet that you can join to be around like-minded people practicing this and being exposed to all the places that you can then create financial freedom, a life worth living. That's right. I so, love that. I love the creating a life worth living. Let's take control. Let's set a course and let's create that life worth living. So thank you again for taking time out of your day to listen to this podcast. We, we love bringing you more in-depth commentary on Nelson Nash's book as well as other passive income streams. The next time we're in this book, Joey, we're going to be talking about um, and even age class of distribution really is just a way that we should be thinking generationally that's right. with this book. So that's going to be a really good one. Hope you tune into that and have an amazing day. This has been the Wealth Without Wall Street podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to the show to break free of the Wall Street mindset and begin building wealth on your own terms in places you understand so that your wealth will never run dry. See you next episode.